So we're here to talk about Aristotle and the great 20th century admirer of his, Ayn Rand, and particular their views on human life and morality. Ayn Rand wrote, deciding whether to use my notes or not, if I don't I could wander around and be more peripatetic. Ayn Rand wrote that there is a morality of reason, a morality proper to man, and man's life is its standard of value. And this is a deeply Aristotelian idea in a few respects. The whole idea of a standard of value is Aristotelian. The idea of man's life, the life of a particular kind of creature, a particular species is Aristotelian. The idea that that life can form some kind of a standard and should form our moral standard, something we aspire to live up to, live up to being human, is deeply Aristotelian. And yet, their views of what man's life is, oh, and I should add, and the idea that man's life is essentially a rational life, is deeply Aristotelian. So in these ways, our two thinkers are of like mind. But there are some also very significant differences as to what the human form of life is, what the role of reason in the rest of life is, how they're related, that set them apart and make Rand's ethics very distinctive, distinctive enough, in fact, but I don't think it's right to call it a neo-Aristotelian ethics, except in the broadest sense in which everything is platonic or Aristotelian, in which case I think it's more Aristotelian than Aristotle's. But I think it'll help us to appreciate both of these thinkers and what they have to say to us to kind of get a sense of what their view each of man's life is, and this is such a fantastic place to be doing it. So... Well, waiting. Okay. I'm going to forgo the notes and try to do this more peripatetic style. It's like, also do like an Aristotelian mic drop at the end if I do it this way. Um, so the idea of a standard of value, the way Aristotle put it, paraphrasing from memory, is for anyone who's capable of choosing how to live, you need to erect a target at which you're going to aim in all of your actions. A target, for example, like education or, uh, or pleasure or honor. These aren't all good things to have as your target, but it's the kind of thing you could imagine someone aiming at in all their actions. Everything they do, they look to this target. Because it's a mark of extreme folly. You'd be an idiot not to have something you're aiming at in life. Not to have something your life is about. Not to have something you look to in all of your actions, modifying them to hit this target. There's something we're trying to accomplish in life, whether we know it or not, whether we could put it into words or not. You have a sense of when your life is going well and badly, when other people's lives are going well and badly. And if you could define what it is for a life to go well or badly, what it is that you're already in some sense inarticulately after in life. Like... Hello? Hello? <laughs> then, like an archer who has a target, you'll be better able to hit... Oh, okay. I'll hold it this way. Uh, then, like an archer who has a target, you'll be more likely to hit on what is right. There's this idea of something that we're looking for, something that we're looking to in making all of our decisions, a standard of value. And it's something abstract, something that we can define, says Aristotle, in outline at any rate. You're not going to be able to fill in all the details, but there's some abstract understanding of what living well is and what's required for it. That if you have it, it'll enable you to make your own choices in your own life better. That's what we're looking for in ethics. That's what it is for something to be a standard of value. And what should this standard be? Well, for both Aristotle and Ayn Rand, it should be life, man's life. And there's a lot packed into this idea of there being such a thing as man's life. You might think there's just, you know, you're living or you're dead. And anything that's living has the same thing, life, some kind of possession or element or something in it. And if it's in a thing, it's alive. And if it's not there, it's dead. Maybe it has a soul. And if the soul's gone, it's dead. 
Maybe the soul can pass into some other kind of creature afterward. But that's not how Aristotle thinks of it. A life is not something you have, but something you do. A life is an activity. It's a busyness. It's a, a being in act. It's a something you're doing if you're alive. And for all the different things that live, it's different things that they're doing. Different but related. There's living for a plant, which consists in growing and reproducing and absorbing nutriment from the world. There's living for an animal, another kind of process, which involves, in addition to the plant stuff, perceiving and desiring some of the things you perceive and moving towards those things you desire and using them to fulfill your nutritional and other needs. And then there's something else, another process as different from, although it can be related to, nutrition and growth as perception and locomotion, sorry, as different from mere seeing and, and moving around as mere seeing and moving around are to mere nutrition and growth. And that's the activity of thinking. In one sense, to be alive is to be thinking. In another sense, it's to be moving and perceiving. In a third and more basic sense, it's to be growing and metabolizing, in effect. Life is an activity, and for each living thing, it's a particular activity. For each plant, a particular way of nurturing itself. For each animal, a particular bios, mode of life, that involves a way of perceiving, moving around, getting food reproducing, etc. And for human beings, life consists largely in thinking. The activity, that's the human activity, what it is that we do is we think. But we don't just think. We live a life in which reason is involved. And it's involved in all parts of our lives. We think but also, many of the other things we do, many of the things we share with animals, how we move about through the world, how we form desires, how and when we act on those desires, is suffused with thinking. It is, as Aristotle puts it, not without reason. The human life is a life of activity of reason and not without reason. That is, of our minds and of the other parts of us besides reasoning, that are influenced by, infused by reason. Of our emotions and motivations in particular is what he has in mind by that. And it turns out for Aristotle that that is the standard of value. This particular kind of life, this particular process of living, which is the human process of living. I should add another distinction. I've been going back and forth between process, activity, something you do, Aristotle's word is activity, and it's a word he created. And it's an important concept, particularly for his ethics, so I think I should share a little about it. So, there's an act, a job, a task, an ergon, a function. Um, there's something you do. There's when you're actually active, you're an ergon, you're at work, you're on the job. And then there's like, at workness, doing your jobness activity, energeia, the two where we get energy, by the way. Um, the state of being at work, of being active. And for Aristotle, this is a little bit different from a process. Um, anything you do, both things that natural objects do, but certainly things that human beings do by reason, has a goal. It has a good. Something it aims at, that structures it, that's its purpose, that is the, what it's trying to achieve. But there's an important difference between things that have their goal outside of and beyond themselves. Things that are means, processes that are means to some end, and when they achieve it, they stop. Like you're building a house, and then at the end, the thing you were aiming at is built, the house, and you stop because it's there. And an activity which is something you do that has its end in itself. The easiest example, I think, for modern people to get behind of this is dancing. When you're dancing a particular dance, there's something you're aiming at, embodying the particular, you know, motion of that dance in your motion. You're trying to do a foxtrot or whatever it is. 
I'm not going to try. Um, but you're, 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 and you're aiming at that. But it's not like, oh, once you've done a foxtrot, you stop. You're aiming at continuing to do it. It's, the end is present while you're doing it. And it's not something that you get to at the end. Uh, likewise, life has to be an activity. Something that's end is in itself. It's, it's, it's a way of being, it's something you're doing that you want to realize and continue doing it. Otherwise, we'll be like the poet who at someone's funeral joked that he'd reached the end for which he had lived. In other words, you know, the end of your life, your death. But that's not what you live for. You don't you know, live until you die with the uh, end, aim of dying well, I guess, unless you're a Klingon. Um, but rather, there's something you're aiming at doing in life. And you want your life to be that, to be that activity. What is that activity? Well, it's the human activity. That's the standard. Okay, but what is it? Well, for the rest of the time, I'm going to talk about Aristotle's and Rand's somewhat differing answers to it. Both of them think it's doing this thing, which is human life. And I talked yesterday about the activity of human life, how we have to learn how to live in the human way. Both of them, I think you could say, think of it as that's what the aim is, just to do that and to do it well. But what is it? Well, for Aristotle, we're aiming to use our reason excellently. The way he puts it is we're aiming to, to have and use virtues. And he describes different virtues. Uh, I'm not going to focus so much on the idea of the virtue as the activities that these virtues are the perfection of. We're trying to do these activities well. All the activities that reason is involved with. Well, what are they? They fall into two broad types, thinking and feeling. There's actual thinking, the activity of reasoning, and then there's feeling, emoting, and making decisions that are involve our emotions, which emotions can be influenced by, shaped by, and can be in accordance with or not reasoning. And so there are two broad types of virtues corresponding to these two broad roles reason plays in our lives. The intellectual virtues, which are the states of having developed good thinking, they're kinds of knowledge. And the activity that we have when we're using them is a kind of knowing or understanding or actually thinking. Um, and then there are virtues of character. Virtues of character or characterological virtues are ways that our emotional system can be set up, ways that our emotions can be set up that accord with proper reasoning. For example, um, you might be somebody who gets angry very easily and holds a grudge, more than it's reasonable to, and it influences your, how you act and how you live. And it's a problem. It's not rational to be this way. It's messing up your life. On the other hand, you might be somebody who, you know, I can just walk all over and you'll never get upset. No matter what I do, you're a pushover, a doormat, and you should be more angry sometimes. I didn't actually intend the rocks to go that far. Sorry. Um, I'm thinking this example is more realistic than I intended it to be. Okay. Um, but the rational way to be with anger is not like that. It's to get angry the right amount at the right way, at the right people for the right amount of time, etc., as determined by reason. And so you could have your emotions kind of, for any of your different emotions, and Aristotle's got a list of the relevant ones, any of your different kinds of motivations, you could have it irrationally intense, irrationally lax, or just tuned in right. That's characterological virtue. What determines what the right tuning in is? Well, one of the intellectual virtues. There are broadly three categories of intellectual virtue. Um, I'll start with a different one than the one to do with emotions for a moment. The virtues correspond to three different kinds of uses of our mind. One, maybe the simplest and easiest to understand, the one that's often a model of thinking of how thinking works for Plato and Aristotle, is craft, techne, art. You know how to make something. For each art, there's a particular end. Medicine, the end is health. And if you're a doctor, if you have the art of medicine, what you have is knowledge of health, and a special kind of knowledge of health that's attuned to how you make health. You understand health, what it is, and how it comes about. You understand its causes in a way that enables you to enact those causes and therefore make somebody healthy. And so you're able to think productively. Let me pause a little bit more on production for a moment and art. There's a real difference between just being able to act 
even reliably act, thinks Aristotle, in ways that produce a result, and being able to knowledgeably act in a way that produces that result. A spider can spin a web. Go off? Yeah. A spider can spin a web, and it can reliably spin the web. And it starts in the same way all the time. And there are reasons why, if somebody were engineering a web, they would start the same way a spider does. But the spider doesn't know that. It just does it, unthinkingly, uncomprehendingly, dumbly, as fire burns. Maybe some of you learned by rote some skill. And you do it the same way every time, and it comes out well every time. Maybe you even have a sense of when to modify it a little bit, and so it comes out well in a variety of circumstances. You learn some recipe from your grandmother, and you can make the recipe, and you learn from her how to tell whether it needs a little more flour or a little less flour, depending on how wet it is. But you don't know why. You just have a sense of how to do, and so you produce the bread reliably. But you don't understand why. But there's something better, more honorable, higher, more human than that mode of functioning in which you understand why you're doing what you're doing. What does needing actually accomplish? Why do you have to do it more and less in some recipes? Why does it feel that way that it feels when you've needed enough and now you can tell? What's being accomplished? What is it? You understand and you're acting from an understanding. And that is techne. That is craft. That is a kind of deep knowledge, not that deep, but deep enough, where you're not just doing something by habit or rote, not just forming expectations and acting on them, not just able to predict and act on the predictions, but understanding what causes what and what the things that you're making are, what it is to be a baguette, and why this kind of flour is the flour for baguettes, but not for biscuits. You want higher gluten flour in the baguette. Sorry for the celiac. Um, so there's a kind of understanding, a kind of grasp of cause, a kind of causal understanding perspective on the world that's present in a craft. And that's part of what's good about the craft. It's what makes it noble and honorable and human. Unlike a production of an animal, which can make certain things reliably, but does it dumbly like fire burns. There are other places in life besides the craft, indeed Aristotle thinks it can be found more so here in the crafts, in which this kind of causal understanding perspective arises. One of them is in our actions, in our decisions in life. Not decisions about whether to add more or less flour, whether to administer this medicine or not. Not decisions that aim at a fixed end laid down beforehand and you have a body of knowledge and abilities about how to achieve that end, but more open-ended decisions, the decisions that make up a life, decisions about how to live. And the body of knowledge about how to live is thronesis, often translated prudent or sometimes practical wisdom. It's the virtue that enables good, thoughtful, intelligent decision-making, decision-making that involves an understanding of why we're acting as we're acting, why this kind of action produces or uh, conduces to or is part of a good human life. It doesn't produce the good human life like the good human life is something apart from this kind of action that comes about through it, but rather the good human life largely consists in acting this way, in acting intelligently, in acting from an understanding of what's good about this kind of acting. That's phronesis. Phronesis is the deliberative virtue the virtue of thought that has to do with deciding and acting. And when we go back to the virtues of character, the virtues of having your emotions in line, it's prudence that they're in line with. I don't mean in line like get in line, but rather they're, they're influenced by, they agree with, you feel the right amount angry. You want the right amount of food. You want to sleep with the right people at the right times in the right way, as opposed to you know, erring on either side. So we've talked about two of the major components of thinking, which is the centerpiece of the human life. We've talked about the thinking involved in producing things and the thinking involved in making decisions. And there's the third. There's contemplation. There's the thinking involved 
in the sciences. There's the understanding how the world works, what it is, what things are deep down. Not with an eye to doing something, but just because you're in love with the world and with causality and you want to know how it works. When you're understanding something, like when you understand a mathematical proof, or you understand deep down the causes of a natural phenomenon, you understand, for example, why the planets and stars revolve around the Earth in the way that they do. I know this is a bit out of date, Keith, but um, in reliably in these circles that you can understand and how, how they do and how it must be this way because it's coming from these causes. You're doing something that you're doing some of when you understand why to knead the bread this way and some of when you understand why to act in this way but sort of more completely and more purely. This kind of knowing, this kind of thinking, isn't for anything beyond itself. It has no use. If you know how to bake some bread, and you understand why to bake the bread that way and why the bread works that way, well, part of what's going on is you're understanding causes, but you're in it for the bread. Part of what's good about it is the bread that it produces, and you need bread. And it's got this extra cool thing that you're doing something human in the way you're getting your bread. Likewise, in the way you're comporting yourself in your activities. But your activities have goals beyond themselves. At least many of them do. But what goal could there be beyond itself to understanding why the stars go around as they do? That's awesome. It's wonderful. It's exciting. You're fully being human. You're using your mind to its utmost in understanding these things. There's a great joy, an aha, a moment of seeing the connection, of grasping a proof, of grasping how this principle explains all this other stuff. And yet it has no purpose beyond itself. And that's part of what's so exciting and noble about it, at least since Aristotle. So then what is for Aristotle the human form of life? Well, it's the life of a reasoner, but in what concrete type of life is it most embodied? There are two. The best life to have for those who can swing it, for those who are smart enough to do it, who are politically situated to do it, who have the biological capacities to do it and the money to do it, not that much money, but enough, is the life of contemplation. A life in which your primary activity what you're doing with your time, what you're organizing and devoting your life around is this activity of contemplation. The best life is the life of a philosopher scientist. There is a second best life, also good, also happy, also human, which would be a life centered around deliberation. Now, obviously, deliberation, good decision-making, is important in any life. And it's going to be an important part of the philosopher's life. He's going to have to make good decisions about how to allocate his resources, how to spend his time, etc. Otherwise, he won't be able to you know, have time to do with philosophy and have his affairs in order. But if you really wanted to specialize in using your decision-making ability to its utmost, you wanted to you know, give maximum scope to this part of you, what would you do? Well, you'd want to get involved in making the biggest, hardest, most complex, momentous decisions. You'd go into politics. And so the second best life is the life of a statesman. Why is it only second best? Well, because it doesn't have much contemplation for it. And moreover, if you're a good statesman who knows how to organize your state and is deliberating best about how to do it well, part of what you'll know is that a really good state is for the sake of letting human beings do what they do best, let human beings fully live a human life. And what kind of a state is that? Well, it's one that allows for there to be philosophers. One that recognizes that the best thing to do isn't just planning about the military or the taxes, but thinking, thinking about the eternal verities. And so part of what you're aiming at in your statesmanship is something beyond the statesmanship, people doing philosophy. 
So we have a first best life and a second best life. Other lives just aren't human enough. They're not a kind of life somebody would choose if they understood all the facts involved and had the abilities. A life devoted to making money, for example, is a life undertaken out of necessity. You're doing it because you don't have enough money. If you had enough money, I mean, you only want the money for what you could do with it. If you had enough money, you'd do something that was worth doing, so the idea goes, other than for the money, and that would be philosophy or if you can't swing it or your circumstances don't allow for it, statesmanship. Such is, I think, the take-home message from Aristotle's ethics. I'll come back to some more inspiring features of it later. But I want to mention also, on the less inspiring features, I take it that you find that all of you who aren't philosophers are at best, second best in your life, and if you're not politicians after that, you've messed up somewhere, or you're unfortunate. Half of you are women, well, a little less than half, which um, you can't quite be either because although you're able to reason, you're just too emotional to stick with it, it turns out. Um, so, but putting that aside, um, there's a reason to bring up the kind of prejudicial material. With how do the philosophers eat? There's a lot of production that needs to be done. It's best if you don't do it yourself. And there are lots of people who it turns out aren't cut out to doing it anyway. And so there's a kind of elitism built into this, a kind of metaphysical elitism where, where some people's leading the best life turns on there being people who are less than fully human, less than fully able to lead a human life, and whose function is to serve those of us who are able to contemplate and able to fully deliberate. There are natural slaves and masters. Aristotle's ethics is at one point, as uh, my teacher Alan put it at one point, Alan Gotthelf, a consumer's ethics. It relies on the goods basically being here, being worked out how to create them. But that's the Aristotelian ideal. It's the ideal of a, ideally, philosopher, contemplator, deliberating wisely and prudently about his affairs, but doing so in order to arrange his life around philosophizing, or, failing that, a prudent deliberator about matters of state. Someone who does this excellently and whose emotions are aligned with his doing it, and someone who does it from a real understanding, a real intelligence about what he's doing. What of Ayn Rand's ideal? Well, Ayn Rand's ideal is the producer. Her heroes are builders of things. But I think in a different way than Aristotle's ideal is the philosopher. It's not that there is some particular professions that embody human life in a way that others don't for Rand. And so the best person is the entrepreneur, and then if you can't be an entrepreneur, maybe you should be uh, you know, somewhere down the line is composer and then philosopher. There's not a rank ordering of what to do in that way. Rather, there's this idea that the activity of human life, the activity which is an end in itself, is the activity of sustaining human life, is the activity of, well, a life is a process of self-sustaining and self-generated action. It's a process of creating the things that human beings live, need. And so central to the activity of human life isn't just the knowing, but the making. And once you think that human life essentially involves creation, essentially involves making, that the goal is to be a sustainer of oneself, then I think it gives you a very different perspective on a lot of the activities within life. 
if Nico's giving me a sign on the time, so I'm shifting my outline slightly. Okay, so think about the Aristotle thinks of life as an activity. He thinks of life as something you do. He thinks of those activities as, in some sense, particularly at the lower levels of life, sustaining themselves. Nutrition is an activity of saving oneself, preserving oneself into the future. In a way, perception and locomotion are. But he doesn't quite think of thinking that way. He thinks of thinking as an activity that could, in principle, go on forever. He thinks it's enjoyed for itself while you're doing it. One way of thinking of what Aristotle's thinking about with thinking is that he doesn't quite have the sense of how it could fit into the rest of a life. There's something different, phenomenal, exciting going on in our ability to understand the world. There's something that people have missed heretofore. People have, when they discovered something, were eager right away to put it to use. You see how it could augment the bottom line, maybe. And they missed something about the kind of complexity, the depth, the way that your mind comes alive when you're tracing things down to their causes. He recognized something new and different was going on in geometry. We're not just noticing patterns of things between numbers. We're understanding why some patterns have to be there because of others, what it is that a triangle is, and why something like that necessarily has to have an angle sum equal to two right angles what it is that the stars are and why they have to move in that way, what an eclipse is and why therefore it has to come about in these conditions and not those. There's something powerful, deep, difficult, engaging of your highest human faculties about that. And yet at the same time, it doesn't seem to put any bread on the table. It doesn't seem to be the kind of thing that could. And people who are too quickly looking for the practical application of it, I think seem to Aristotle and to Plato and to the Greek philosophers at the time to be kind of missing the point, missing the point of something important in life. There's something obviously right and good and powerful here about understanding, about depth, and yet it's not clear how it fits into the rest of human life. What the hell could you do with knowing what causes an eclipse? It's not like you could make one. Or maybe you could like scare some people by telling them it's gonna come because you know it's gonna come. You could do a couple of things. You could maybe get a bumper olive crop, uh, predict when there's gonna be a bumper olive crop as Aristotle tells us Thales did and corner the market on you know olive oil presses and make a fortune, but like, that's pretty small compared to knowing how the universe works. You could do a few tricks, you know, with it and, and make a buck here and there. That's not what's cool about Thales, that he was able to make a buck on olives. And we could point that out about him to say, yeah, yeah philosophers could all get rich if we wanted to. But it's, um, there's something that's being missed, thinks Aristotle. And there's something right, that there's something kind of profound here about knowledge. And at the stage that Aristotle was in human history, it's hard to imagine how you could know what's going to come of that. How you could see how that fits into the rest of human life. How you could see how it plays a role in the process of sustaining yourself. In any way other than trying to make it servile to narrow, immediate practical ends. There's something wrong with saying what's good about knowing astronomy is you could, you know, get good prices on olive oil, right? That's, there's something off about that. Um, even if we think in the end that knowledge is about empowering life. I'll say a word about a third philosopher besides Aristotle and Rand here. Bacon, who's the first who I think made this connection, that deep knowledge is practical. And he too, Bacon, was contemptuous of the people he called empirics or mechanics who tried to subordinate all science to 
trinkets and gadgetry right away. Bacon's idea was that, no, deep knowledge is worth having because it can make us like gods. Knowledge is powerful, not on I've got some great app, app for this you know, latest discovery in physics, but you can change the world. You can become a master of the universe if you understand how it works deeply enough. But Bacon's seeing of that had to do with seeing the new peoples in the Americas and how primitive they were compared to the Europeans, which Europeans only knew a handful of things. What if we really understood the things deeply, thought Bacon. Um, Aristotle didn't have that, and I didn't think could have that. And I think it causes a kind of rigidity in his thinking about really abstract knowledge. He doesn't see it as continuous with the rest of life. And so he sees the rest of life as kind of empowering it for those of us who are able to have it. He sees it as in a, um, everything else is for the sake of it and not the other way around. Once you do, though, fit the rest of knowledge into life, once you do think of human beings as a understander and producer, once you recognize that that's what the human form of life is about, once you realize that once we get it right, we can soar as that chart of life expectancy and GDP I gave you the other day shows. And when you understand that what GDP means not just GDP, but what wealth means and higher standard of living means isn't just that you get you know, a couple of more slices of bread or a slightly bigger house, but the ability to prolong life greatly, the ability to educate many more people, the ability to understand the world much more deeply because you have machines that let you see into things, which machines you've built based on your previous understandings of things, which then will give you more power practically and so forth. Once you understand how it all hangs together, and once you understand how everything that we get from human beings, everything that's worth having that human beings can provide for one another comes from some exercise of this suite of abilities in one way or another. I think you get a very different conception of what kind of life is possible for us individually and as a society, of what kinds of lives fully realize the ideal of a rational animal, how many different professions it's realizable in, anyone that's a legitimate profession, not, you know, armed robber, um, but any one that's actually productive, of how the intellectual professions, the sciences, higher mathematics, philosophy, are indeed productive and how that's part of what's good about them, and how they're all variations on this theme of human life. All right, I think we're at time, Nikos, is that right? Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. So the way we're gonna do the Q&A, we have 15 minutes. After that, we're gonna, give, we're gonna have five minutes to stretch a bit. So we have two mics. Anyone who has a question, we give you the mic. Make sure it's relatively short question. So we start from the gentleman over there and then our friend over there. Thanks, Greg. Um, could you extend this? Uh, I liked the progression of this talk. Can you extend that progression to what the life of an intellectual is like under a Randian ethics? And specifically, for my own for my own question, it since we now know that intellectual pursuits are to be productive, what does that look like in the life? within the life of an intellectual, perhaps when the intellectual doesn't make that much money off of his discoveries or maybe hasn't made any money off of his discoveries. Because I can say, just, you know, in my own life, my life looks a lot more like the uh, life of contemplation of Aristotle's than uh, Bacon's ideal or Rand's ideal. And so, um, any thoughts on that? You like powers yet. Not yet. Um, yeah, I think... It comes up in the following way. You have to recognize that it's your responsibility as a human being to feed yourself, to provide for yourself, to support yourself. 
you have to recognize that if the activity that you think is so valuable really is valuable, then it's going to, in some way or another, bring value to other people. Other people have to be able to recognize that. Um, and you know, will be able to recognize that, are able to recognize that because they're human beings, if you can make the case to them. And then you have to think about how to make that case for them. How to show that what you're doing is worth doing. Provides benefits to other people such that they can, in exchange for that, give you the money you need. Uh, as opposed to what? As opposed to an attitude that I think a lot of academics have of what I'm doing is good, it's deep, it's better than what you're doing, and you know, <laughs> you ought to be supporting me in doing it. I'm owed a living. I'm owed support in this activity because it's intrinsically good. Nothing's intrinsically good. What it is to be good is to be good for human life, to be good for somebody. You love this activity because you think it's good, but what its goodness is consists in it's making a contribution to human life. Maybe the contribution is such that it'll lead to great invention someday. Maybe it's spiritual that'll give you a deeper perspective on something but that'll help you. But in some way, there's some value to what you're doing, or at least you think there is, right? Not like there isn't in your case, but anyone who's trying to do intellectual work. And you have an obligation to deal with other people as traitors with respect to that and to think about how can I make the value of what I'm providing objective to other people and solicit their support for it in one form or another. Maybe I could offer to teach them or tutor them or give lectures or ask for donations from somebody who has a reason for wanting to support this cause. Or, and there are lots of different ways to do it and you know, one can be on, maybe I should start a YouTube channel and people will watch and they can monetize it this way, that way. But whatever the particular entrepreneurial solution is, there's a kind of entrepreneurship that's inherent in human life. It's inherent in thinking of productiveness as a virtue. It's that you're responsible for making what you do with your life support your life. And if what you're doing with your life is something that's good and worthwhile, then it supports human life in general. It, it has outputs that, that help to sustain a human life. And you should be able to find a way to capture some of that value commercially. And it's up to you to figure out what that way is, including by finding people who are good at doing that, who you could pitch yourself to and they could, you know, do the more nuts and bolts of the entrepreneurial work. I've been very fortunate to find such people. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. And, um, Nikos is in charge of calling people. Are we video recording this, by the way? I don't see. Oh. Okay, cool. Hi. Uh, so my question would be on the second best life as portrayed by Aristotle on the statesman. Uh -huh. um, how would, because I know in principle, the RAND does not have anything against holding a position in government as a principle, because as we know, government is uh, necessary for protecting rights. But how would objectivism see a career such as a, a judge or an ambassador or something that's exclusively related to government? Um, I think it would be one profession among others. That is, I don't think there's a, a hierarchy for objectivism of jobs. Best to be either an inventor or a novelist. If you can't swing that, then, you know, the, uh, etc. There's some journal entries in which Rand is reflecting along these lines, by the way, that maybe John Galt and her are the most, you know, more fully embodiments of humanity because they don't just do abstractions, but they bring them into concrete. But I think her considered view is that that's not really right. There's a, what, what is important is that you see what you're doing as fitting into a whole human life and certain, and certain careers for aesthetic purposes illustrate that whole cycle better than others. But any career, if it's a legitimate career, is legitimate. And what makes it legitimate? A legitimate is too weak a word, but let me say any career, if it's legitimate, is such that it could be the centerpiece of a morally exemplary, ideal, fantastic, as good as it can be life. What makes a career legitimate is that it uses your mind, uses the human mind to produce values that sustain human life. And what makes it proper for you is that you love it, and it uses your facilities to the utmost. You have to push yourself and grow in it and not stagnate. 
And can you do that as a judge? Yeah, sure. I mean, justice is a, uh, you know, is a um, difficult thing to achieve. It's, it, it, it's a real value. Uh, judges have real work to do. Read Tara Smith's book on judging and objectivity in law to get a sense of some of the kinds of work that are involved in, in you know, jurisprudence. This is something you can dedicate your life to. And Now, depending on what country you're in and how exactly the regime is, maybe you'll find that it's too corrupt uh, and you can't do it, but then figuring out and working to make it less corrupt, to make it better, however you can do that, whether it's working within or without of the regime. Um, I'm not saying both will work in every case, but the, the process of thinking about how do I improve the society I'm in, how do I do it better, is, is definitely a worthwhile pursuit. It's a pursuit that requires difficult, hard thinking and can prolong, sustain, defend human life. Uh, and so it's, it's fantastic. Likewise for many careers in government, um, not all of them. I don't know that being a tax collector or something could be like that. I think it can't. But um, ambassador, I think, could, for example, depending on the circumstances. Uh, yeah. Um, where do people in Aristotle or Randian view stand people of mental illnesses, for example, clinical depression or constant physical pain, and they're not able to be productive? Mm -hmm. So where do they stand? So for Aristotle... They're not able to contemplate about uh, things mm -hmm. like you described. So... When we think about the human ideal, when we're thinking about the standard that we're aiming at in life, we're not thinking of... We're thinking about that which someone who's able to direct their life to at least some extent is aiming at, not something they're guaranteed to hit. And one really important distinction between Aristotle, who I think is right on this, and the later schools of philosophy uh, that developed here in Athens, the Stoics and the Epicureans, is that the Stoics and the Epicureans wanted to make an ideal that wasn't just accessible to everybody who could understand the ideal, such that it's possible for them to realistically aim at it, but such that if you understand it properly, you're guaranteed to hit it. And Aristotle doesn't think that. He thinks it's such that if you're aiming towards something, you might not hit it, and luck might intervene, for example. A horrible tragedy might befall you. And we shouldn't say that you've therefore achieved the ideal life because you did everything you could. You've achieved what you're aiming at. It might be what, that you can't achieve certain things. And that it's a tragedy for you that you, for example, were struck down in your prime or got a certain disease. It's admirable and wonderful that you did what you did in the circumstances and, and, and weathered it as well you could, but it's not the best life. It's not what would have been the best life for you, and it's not what you were aiming at. And I think it's important to preserve that insight that, what we're, that our reach should exceed what we're guaranteed to grasp if we reach well that we shouldn't be afraid, so afraid of accidents and possible misfortunes that we pretend that they make no difference, that it's just as well to be wretchedly sick as to be well. But I also think if you understand the power of reason, what human beings can achieve, and you have a more flexible version of what the best human life is than that it's excelling in a certain one or two careers, then you can see that for most kinds of setbacks, most people can have, there's still a way that a life that fully realizes what's good about human life is accessible to them. There are all kinds of people who, despite different kinds of severe handicaps, persevere in having a life in which they're directing their own life by their own thinking. And they're doing it in a way that's productive and that's fulfilling. There are people who can't achieve that, and it's tragic. But it's, I think, a very small minority of people, and the more developed medicine and other technologies get, it's smaller still. There's another thing, though, to say about Aristotle and mental illness. Um, one of the things that's really interesting in Aristotle is he distinguishes between vices and mental illness, and virtues of mental illness, for that matter, um, and... I guess for the interest of time, I shouldn't go into that, but there is um, a lot of attention to 
determining what's virtuous and vicious based on what's possible for normal people, people who are in you know, the normal physiological states, and then recognizing that there might be exceptional conditions people are in which lead to either good or bad traits that are um, such that people can't be praised or blamed for them and they're not, um, not valuable in that way. You evaluate them as good or bad in the sense that it's unfortunate or fortunate to have them, but um, not in the sense of morally good or bad.